Oh, what a lad. Well, we've done it. We've finally got him on, one of the all-time great lads, and many would regard him as the greatest Marco of all time. And then you speak to any of the Highlanders from the 2015 team, and they'll tell you how influential he was in their side winning the 2015 Super Rugby title. And he also is, in my opinion, probably the best player to have never been capped internationally. While post-playing, he also went on to become one of the best defensive coaches in the game, and he has an incredible story, which I'm really looking forward to talking to. Um, one of the greatest men of all time, it is the great Shane Christie. Welcome, mate. I love your intro, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Thank you. It's mate, a, yeah. I spoke all true words there, like some good memories of you, um, playing for the Marco and the Highlanders, even New Zealand Maldives, but um, you've had... A hell of a career, and um, I know it's such a cool story because I obviously um, met you here at Nelson Rugby Football Club. Uh, great to be here at, in the club rooms to do this podcast. But um, your journeys are not your typical rugby journey. Like you, you really ground through mm. early days, eh? Yeah, yeah. A lot of hard work at the start, and yeah, it's like. How did I end up making it as a professional rugby player? It's like, whoa, that yeah. happened, yeah. But it took a long time. I was late. I was like 25, 26 before I made Tasman. Yeah. yeah. yeah we will get all to the, into all that. But how how are you feeling now? Like a lot of people probably, a lot of the questions that came in was, where, where is he? What's he been doing? Um, you were coaching the Highlanders. You were coaching Tasman. Now yeah, you're not. So what are you up to? The last year I've just taken a year off, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I actually got cut from the Landers, Joe. Did you? Time, yeah. I, I didn't tell you that, eh? Nah. I thought you left. Oh, no, you got they, cut? They cut me. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a good story. Tell it. Straight away? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dive straight in. <laughs> it's uh, just the way the season had gone. In the couple of years that I was down there, I enjoyed it and the experience was good, but there was a lot more frustrating days than mm-hmm. than I enjoyed, you know. It was a grind, man. For me, my like, with trying to work through full-time coaching with my concussion and stuff and then the pressure of trying to get into that level at coaching. Yeah. And then I guess the we were a battler team that wasn't always performing that well. Um, so there was there was pressures in in the whole experience but I couldn't go back if it was going to be the same mm-hmm. if 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 I was working really hard to get the D right and then the attack was, wasn't the good and I didn't feel like the expectation on the standard and the commitment and some of our, our attack was, was probably in my opinion was leading us down and of course I could be wrong and mm. things aren't always as you seem but it was just like I felt like if I had an involvement in the attack, it could have been the attacking breakdown or 22 and take. I think I could have had a better influence in how we were scoring tries in that. And yeah, yeah, I felt like that. I felt like at times the there wasn't enough expectation on how our attack was going. Yeah, and um, the execution and the standard that we set, I just didn't believe that it was the right mm. way forward. Yeah. So that was a cool experience, and like, I think they're going to get Kenny, Kenny Lynn down there next year, which is awesome. I've heard he's a really good coach. Goody yeah. said he's good. Yeah, but if Goody said he's good. He's good. It's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I looked at the Landers this year, and they the same problems. Mm. And man, I'm happy I didn't go back because I couldn't get through another year like that. Yeah, yeah. If it wasn't for surfing, I, I would have been struggling down yeah. there. That's the good thing about Dunedin. And the boys are amazing, man. There's a lot of really cool guys. The coaches are awesome, but I think, I just think the the expectation sometimes isn't right down there. Mm. And when Jamie was there, it was all on. He brought that, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People like this, like the stories that even yeah, that you hear from the players that have been under Jamie and yeah. Burles when he was on a yeah. month ago or something like. He was for real. Yeah. <laughs> Headshots only. Yeah. Toughen up. <laughs> 5 a.m. <laughs> Camps. He's so. the man and the boys respected that. And I yeah. think it, like a team that 
for us anyway, they don't have the superstars down there. Mm. So you have to you have to be real if you want to win against teams like you guys, the Crusaders, yeah. the best players in the world. You got to bring an edge. You got to be different. Yeah. And it has to be your mindset and expectation. I think. Yeah. How else can you do it? You, know, you can't. You're right <laughs> you can't. on, mate. They've, how have they let you go? That is incredible. But it was funny. That's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> Good start. But you mentioned like. Um, struggling down there with your head, like coaching full-time while still suffering from concussion. Like, how is your head now? And, like, um, what does suffering through concussion look like for you these days? The last six months have been tough since losing Bill, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a, that's been an incredible experience for me and then seeing how it happened. Mm. Um, so without going into that just right now, that really rattled me and um, I suppose when with my concussion and like I think a lot of people when you're under serious stress you can get bad headaches all your symptoms come back Mm -hmm. and then you just you've got a basic a threshold of your energy and every time you your battery drops if you get put under stress it drops again and then it just takes longer to get it back so when I'd worked for I did a season, my first season in 21 with the Landers and then went straight into Tassie. Mm. At the end of those two seasons, I was done. Yeah. Like I was buggered. My head had been, I was getting heaps of symptoms and I was just grinding through. Still loved it and it was good to get back to Tasman and refresh and be under the sun and awesome culture. Mm. But going back into that 22 super season, I was really struggling. And... I guess that is an experience that I probably wouldn't have I wouldn't have signed two years for the Landers, even though I said, hey, I'm not, I don't know how this is going to go. You know, I'm trying to get into full-time work um, and full-time coaching and then the change of pressure and stuff, it's a bit more intense. But um, once I'd gone through that first year for those two seasons, I was probably operating at like 40, 50%. Mm. And then you get through the next season. So last July, I got back to Tassie and, and I was I'd taken the Tasman season off to recover. Yeah, I didn't start feeling good till like January or February. Far out, <laughs> yeah, man. So what are you feeling? Just headaches and tired, headaches, fo- fogginess. Yeah, um, like ringing in my ears, vision problems. Oh. Sometimes if I'm bad, I'll have issues with my speech. And shit, yeah, yeah. I mean, you probably you may have seen noticed different things in me and my mood. And oh, oh the thing I remember is coaching with you was. Like sometimes just having to go off and have a sleep, you know, like oh, in yeah, the middle yeah. of like we'd everyone would go for a coffee, but you'd go sit in the van and just sleep to rest, recharge, recharge. Yeah. And I was like, far out. That's that's pretty crazy. But it is, yeah. You just lose your energy faster, you know. You've got mm. you've got so much, and you can be like that, and you feel and operate maybe like a normal person, but then when you lose your energy, you've got to get it back somehow. And if you keep on, if you don't refill it, it takes a lot longer to come right. Mm. That's the other thing. So if I've got if I've got headaches and stuff, and I'm not feeling that well, um, like you might feel like that for a day or two, and have a couple of good nights sleeps, it might take me a week to come right. Yeah, yeah. And is there light at the end of the tunnel, or like it's been how long's it been since yeah? Twenty sixteen, I started having my concussion Far problems. Out. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's light, man. Yeah, I know that I can come right. Because, like I said last, this January, February, I was feeling really good and oh, yeah. I was exercising hard out. I got a chest freezer and I was ice bathing every day. Oh, yeah. Like 15, 20 minutes. True. Ice baths three or four times a day. Oh, wow. I, I brought a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing hot colds every day, bro. Yeah. Yeah, it's for real because I'm like. What's happened? Are you still doing it? Yeah, I started oh, yeah. back up after, um, like, just recently. Like, oh, yeah. I. I with the stress of going through with Billy and then I help with the girls team. Oh yeah. Like when you're when you're busy and you're trying to do normal stuff, your your health goes out the back door. Yeah. You know? So I didn't have the energy to get back in the sauna, bro. Yeah. <laughs> or into yeah. the ice bath because it's hard. You don't want to sit in that ice bath for ten minutes, man. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> it sucks, but time. I know for for my life Good and, for and yeah. to to come right, I've yeah. got to do it. And there's other things that you can do, but I think the main thing there's this. Um, is ice bathing, cold therapy, mm. high intensity exercise. When I can get my threshold up, I can actually run for 30, 40 minutes, but it just takes time to be able to do it. Yeah. And then fasting. Oh, yeah. So I've been doing heaps of fasting the last year, and yeah. it's been a crazy year, but 
what does it look like for me in the future? I suppose I, I want to try and I've been speaking to New Zealand rugby and losing Bill and like, man, he had bad concussion when he finished his rugby career and he had other things going on, but seeing his behaviour and, you know, the way he was around different things in his life, I can see that he's still having issues with his head. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to get to a stage where, I, where if you don't look after yourself, that's where you end up. And I think it's it's really sad to see that he couldn't get the right help because... Like we're all responsible for our own health, that's for sure. Mm. But when you end up with concussion from rugby, you might think that like it is when you're playing, you get help for basically everything. Mm. But when you come off contract and then on to ACC and the public medical system, you're by yourself. Mm. If you don't have a, a strong partner that can handle your mood swings and your, the different things with you deal with cognitive issues mm. or a family that understands it really well, you're by yourself. And so it's an interesting thing. It'd be cool to talk about that and we'll have a yarn and see where we can come up with because there's, there's probably not enough in New Zealand rugby in prevention. Yeah. Um, and and then I think we, for me anyway, if I hadn't had so many. How many did you have? <sighs> no idea. Heaps, man. Mm. I was thinking about this before I came in. My first concussion was in Taka when I was... 18, 19, playing for Nelson Club, senior bees. <laughs> and I'd had a head knock and I was feeling a bit drowsy and the, the bus ride up to the top was like, shit, this is no good, I'm feeling crook. Mm. Um, the boys were having a few beers, bus trip home, and I tried to have a beer and I was like, man, I'm crook as. Jumped out and spewed, vomited outside the bus and I was like, shit, this isn't good. I've had a head knock, told the staff, and I was like, you just chill. And that was my first concussion when I was 19. Mm. And then my next one was, I think I was around 21, out here on Tea Park. And there was a trial maybe for the Bays team and I tackled someone and hit my head on their hip. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the time, but Kahu stopped me from walking the wrong direction, oh, pulled me off the field. And I remember I came right into the ambulance and he was like what's your name, what's your address, and I couldn't remember for 10 or 15 minutes. Shit. Yeah. And then that took me, you know, a couple of weeks off work and um, then a couple of weeks just gradually getting back into it. And I suppose that was before I even started playing senior rugby, you know, like, and then went into provincial rugby for years and then super for a couple of years. But the key thing that I absolutely think is true is that I had too many in a short period where I wasn't quite right. Mm. And like a lot of players, we want to play. So you knew you weren't quite right? I didn't really understand that. Yeah, I may have, it may have concussion problems. Mm. Like I'd had, I was getting the concussion tests and I was getting a little bit dizzy during the week and, um, and I had a neck problem from probably a head knock that, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pinched my neck. And and that's how you can also get those referring headaches. Yeah. And But, yeah, I, I realised I wasn't right. And then I thought, right, I got through the Tasman season. And then I couldn't run high intensity. Because you'd get a headache. Because I just get, like, blurry, yeah. foggy, dizzy. And then I thought, sweet, I'm just going to get through weights did weights and then went back into the 27, uh, 2017 super season then contact was I was still having problems and then running I was still getting issues with my high intensity running for certain periods so I just I tried to do we did a, a pretty good three month return to play protocol with the doctor at the time Greg McLeod and he really looked after me and he tried to get me back and after two setbacks of like high intensity running for 30 or 40 minutes and I couldn't do it, then I knew it was probably time to pull pin. Mm. But so, yeah, I had a lot of head knocks like a lot of boys do. But the, the key thing is that a lot of my head knocks weren't actually like they might have been because you're with different doctors, eh? Yeah. And in different teams. And it's not always yeah. clear. And it's not all the information isn't connected or collected. So it's yeah. like I think that's the big thing that we could do better in rugby is as soon as you start playing age grade rugby, if you have a head knock that needs to be noted down and it doesn't matter who you're with, if you continue that 
that sport in in a contact sport you need to make sure that you've got these concussions at different periods mm. doesn't matter what doctor you're with or what team you're with they need to be noted in some sort of file system that mm. that you can have if you have five or ten over a couple of years you've got to take a year off yeah or um yeah or even maybe a couple like Tane Robinson is one that's had a few yeah in the last couple of years like I see he's back and he's doing really well but if he was to get a couple more next year, he's got to think about, man, this is probably something I need to look at and have a year off. Yeah. Yeah. What no. would you have done differently? Like if you could go back in time, would you have finished your career earlier? Would you have taken a bigger break earlier? Well, how would you have done it? The season, the 2016 season when I was getting them bad, I'd come, I'd come into Tasman and I'd had a really average 2016 super and I was disappointed with that. And then, it's a collective thing with the player and the and the doctors. Yeah. You know, like it's better now, but only how long's that? Seven, eight years ago. It wasn't as good back then and we were a little bit more not lenient, but we didn't understand that, man, if you've had a couple of head knocks in one season, this guy's mm. red flag big mm. time. Which now if you get a couple of head knocks in a couple of seasons, everyone knows that guy's sort of in a you gotta be weary. And yeah. if he gets another couple he's out. Um, even the return to play protocols were only five or seven days back then. Yeah. That's been changed. And yeah. r- really just recently, mm. now it's 12 days minimum for someone under 21 or something. Mm. So I think me personally, how would I have changed things? It's a maturity thing. You've got to say, man, I've had a head knock. I'm not feeling good. Yeah, I've got to take a couple of weeks off and then the doctors have got to, take the lead and make sure that that's and that's what it is now but back then I don't know what I could have done Jim it was I was a different person you know I didn't mm. see it like I do now yeah I don't think many kids do or many kids will that's why it's such a hard area like you can fake those concussion tests or pass those tests if you want to and say that you're feeling sweet and get back out there but um, you're right it's got to you've got to take a little bit of accountability on it eh? yeah you have to yeah it was. I was talking to Fozzie oh, yeah. <laughs> last week and we were talking about the concussion tests and the culture back when we were starting out, it was like the the first test you do, you know, if you do it well, but if, you, if you're if you a little bit rough, it probably means that you're going to pass the next one if you're not quite right. So yeah. the culture wasn't good amongst the players. Yeah. And that's changed a lot because we've seen so many injuries with concussion and people losing their careers and having ongoing issues. But yeah. It took time to maybe build that culture of concussion safety up. Yeah. And I've been surprised it's taken so long because it's been happening in NFL for years. Mm. Yeah, and I feel like even NRL's a little bit more, more behind. It looks like guys are out and then they somehow push off the trainer or like go for the HR and come back on. And I'm like, well, oh, that's, I don't know how he's managed to do that, but. Um, Did you see that there was a um, a doco on a dude that lost his life up in Auckland, a club player in league? Nah, he had a head knock, and it was quite bad. He was getting bad symptoms for a few months. I forget his name. I watched it on Sunday, and he came back. The doctors, his GP, said you should probably take a month off, and he returned to play after a week. He took true. one week off, returned to play the next week, got another head knock, and he died on the field. Ah, oh, yeah. And ACC brought out some legislation that automatic three week stand down if you've had a head knock. Mm. Um, and they did that in a month. And then the league brought out some rules, some regulations saying the similar thing. And they did that within a week. Sure. So, it was how many more people need to die before we do anything? Mm. And I think the awareness thing isn't is where it should be. There's mm. no way. I went to after. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot since Bill and there was a lady I forget I think she's got a couple of businesses around the country her name's Helen she's with the Southland team and she's done some concussion and stuff for Hunty oh yeah yeah, and yeah. in the All Blacks yeah she was had a little um, like a speech up here a bit of a meeting and at the pavilion I went to that about two or three months ago and there was 10 or 12 people there true yeah so in a perfect world, you'd have all the club coaches there, the age grade, mm. women's and men's, 
and educate the coaches so we get a better culture around concussion. Mm. And there was a couple of people there, mountain bikers, a couple of parents that had kids that had concussion from rugby. Yeah. And then whose responsibility is that to start organising these things? Mm. Well, the, let's start with the provincial unions and then NZRU probably need to take responsibility about getting these um, seminars into rugby because we've got a problem with concussion but there's not enough awareness and is it because we're scared of being honest about what's happening with concussion mm -hmm. like like in in rugby we try and go towards the pressure Joe yeah <laughs> let's yeah. just confront it be open and honest and then try and make sure we have a better awareness around it and people are more educated so that it just doesn't keep on happening because at the worst case it's the multiple head knocks over a short period that's going to mean you have long issues mm. later on. But a couple head knocks is, you're fine. Mm. You're sweet. Mm. You're going to be all good in a couple months or a few weeks, but not consecutive head knocks. And from a young age, if you don't keep track of them. Yeah. Be patient with it, eh? But I think that's why having you on this podcast is so awesome, being able to give some awareness to the concussion world and um, share your thoughts and insights to it all because you've been through it all, you've you've done it, you have you know that what it feels like and to be able to share your thoughts and for people to hear it, young players might be in the situation, make them realise that, man, I'm not quite right, maybe I, I won't play or maybe I will take a month stand down because I don't want to have these multiple concussions in a row where I could potentially die or um, have long-term injuries. So it's, it's pretty scary. Mm, yeah, and this is what your show's about, man. It's cool. It's cool what you're doing, Jim. <laughs> How cool. It's uh, it's probably it's probably needed more often than, than, than what we get in the mainstream media and individual journalism and podcasts is how you maybe can get more real, genuine yeah. communication going on that isn't, you know, censored. Yeah, that's it. And, and about concussion, you know, with with Billy's passing mm. and his service out here, they, like there was a real fear around talking about mental health and concussion and mm. what he went through leading up to his suicide. And there were hundreds of people in the pavilion as friends that knew what he was like that was hardly addressed mm -hmm. and then there were probably a few hundred people maybe a thousand people online I don't know but I remember tuning in watching it and where were you? you I was at the airport in Christchurch <laughs> about to catch a flight to one of our games and I remember you getting up and speaking and yeah well that wasn't genuine mm -hmm. it wasn't for Bill it was anything but the truth of what had happened to Bill, like he'd done things in those last few years around trying to get his health right, man, and a lot of people really tried to help him, and and his family tried to help him, and his mum spent three years with him trying to keep him calm and get him on the right direction, And but Bill was, he found it quite hard to change your lifestyle, mm -hmm. and that's it's tough, I found it really hard to change the way I was sort of just you got to change how you are. And when you're feeling good, you need to remember that if you carry on like you were with like sleeping or eating and overexerting yourself, you're probably going to have a setback. So it's a complete change of lifestyle. And for Bill, that he found that really hard. And I think that without the right support and stuff, it can, it can, it can lead to something where you get bad mental health. And mm. there was a real fear... Um, to be honest about what he experienced, and when I when I spent some time looking into where he was for those couple months after, it's like there was nothing there was nothing in his life that couldn't have been fixed with close friends and family, but because of the way he was probably feeling, he pushed a lot of people away mm -hmm. because he didn't want to be a burden on anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, he was really suffering mentally, and it was. Is because too many people, myself included, man, as one of his good friends at a time that I couldn't understand that I needed to be there for him, just to listen. I didn't. I couldn't. I, I tried to 
be the help that I thought he needed, but it's not right. You know, we don't. Everyone's different. And um, going back to the the service, it was like it's okay to be honest about people having mental health stuff and mm. be honest about we had a rugby coach that finished his career with concussion and we're not even going to address that and try and bring more awareness for the younger players and the current players mm. because if we don't be honest about what's happening, man, we ain't going to go forward very well. Mm. What well, does that help? Like you, you spoke about um, the type of help that he needed. Like when you do see someone struggling at – I'm sure a lot of listeners will know of someone who they think far out he's struggling. Like, what is the best thing, in your opinion, to help him? Billy just needed someone to listen to, I think, and then he couldn't. Like, he had a real problem with with boundaries. He was one of the most caring, loving people I know. Mm. Over the last couple of years, he had three homeless people living at his house, Jim. True. Looking after them, people that he'd met, and he knew that they needed a helping hand up, and he took them in under their wing. But he probably wasn't capable of doing that because he needed to help himself. Mm-hmm. Um, so he needed real strong guidance around him that understood his condition and maybe monitored him on a daily or weekly basis. Where I think. You probably need a couple people in your family, a couple close friends that really care about you, a specialist, a GP, someone in the union, and create a team around someone that's finished with concussion. Mm. And if that team understands the player or the person quite well, and then, say, has a a tough couple months and pushes a couple of them away and that relationship breaks down, then someone else needs to jump in Mm. and the team around that person they can help but they rely on each other so they don't all take the burden you know yeah and then have that going for and it might take three or four years you know but with with the medical system at ACC it's like you've got a case manager and you'll have a specialist and maybe a GP that can help you but they're not your family or your friends and if you don't have that partner yeah and if you don't have that, that family set up that can actually support you and understand, because it's really isolating concussion, mm-hmm. it's hard for people to understand what you're going through and and it takes a group of people to actually be around them consistently and just check in, check in on what's happening and um, Bill sort of pushed people away and then ended up being really isolated and he was going through tough times and I don't think anyone really understood how bad he was. Mm. Have you got that group around you? Like you speak about people with concussion needing that support. Have you got that support that you need? I do. Holly's been back in New Zealand oh, true. since last, uh, since this March or something and because I was really buggered after Bills, I ended up staying with her for a couple months and yeah. she was, I just, Good, good person to talk to she knows me well and she's been helping me with I've, I've been getting a little bit of therapy and mm. um, some things to try and get my head right as well and then I'm looking at some different things that I can do for like my diet and um, concussion like this that chamber hyperbolic chamber oh, yeah. and stuff like that and there's a couple of things that I'm going to look into to try and get past the stage I'm at but mm. I've got a, a close friend that I've been talking to Craig I caught up with Craig the other day mm. and Craig Moore um, I've got I've got a group of people that I can rely on mm. and if I got to a stage where I thought I was in danger of going downhill or feeling like I was suicidal then I'll give you a ring <laughs> I hope you do. You know, I've I've learned a lot since yeah. since Bill, bro, and I think that's one. Like I messaged Bill in August, and and I was still trying to help him. Like I thought he needed help, man. Mm-hmm. It wasn't right, mm-hmm. and he was he was reaching out for help then, but I didn't see it. Mm-hmm. But then he wasn't able to say, "Man, I'm not right. I need help. Come and see me." Mm-hmm. Which it takes it takes a lot, I think. Yeah. And then when when you see a really close friend take their life and then 
it's just like there's nothing that is a problem. People care about you. Mm. And I think he didn't realise that people all over the country loved that dude. Mm. He played for so many teams and he inspired so many players and people that were older, more experienced, younger. Yeah, yeah. Like he was a character. Yeah. Man. And but he couldn't he couldn't quite reach out and just say it how it is. And because we're scared, we're scared to say the truth about a lot of things like concussion. Mm. How can we have a service for someone that was an absolute legend in the Marco jersey and we couldn't speak, his friends couldn't speak. So we've got to we got to get over ourselves and this is what's happening mm. all around the world and in our country, not just about concussion, but we're very we're very scared of hurting feelings. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to say the truth about things anymore because we're worried that it's going to cause more damage then, but it's yeah, not. Yeah. You know, truth hurts, but it's temporary, and how do you get progress without it? Yeah, and it's something you've always done, eh? Even, well, even since I've known you, you've always been one of those guys who have just told it how it is, like um, no sugarcoating stuff, and I think that's why you're such a great coach because people knew um, it was coming from the right place, and if it hurts, then it's probably – it's probably true, so um, and it's to make you get better. So something you've always done well. I think like your first question about oh yeah, how did I sort of get into rugby is when I was when I was twenty one, my stepdad died, and then I realised like I was a larrikin in my late teens and early twenties, and then I realised if I was going to try and make rugby, because when he died, I thought, man, I really want to give this a crack. Was he a rugby player? Yeah, he wanted me to be a professional oh, yeah. rugby. He wanted me to train hard. And oh, yeah. I was just like pretending. Mm. So then that's when I started really talking to myself about, man, stop pretending. And every time I didn't want to go train, I was like, man, you got to do you got to work hard. And yeah. when I started being honest with myself and then I had success, I was like, that's probably the way to be. Mm. So that wasn't until, what, 21? 21 he passed away and that's what inspired me to start training really hard yeah so what were you like before that were you a gifted player coming through the ranks i don't think i was gifted like talented i was just my game was built on effort yeah Yeah. tackling even from a young age yeah 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 effort yeah and i later on i probably got a bit more skillful getting coached by good coaches and being around professional environments and you know, Rangi and KK and mm. playing sevens really helped me with my conf- confidence. Yeah. That was a big difference. Um, but my game was just effort, man. Mm. Yeah, effort and honesty with myself. Yeah. And then when I've ended up coaching, I try and even as a captain in different teams, just be honest about things. And I think that's the way forward instead of no sugar coating. Yeah. <laughs> so you you were born in Wellington, is that right? I was Palmy. born in Palmy. Palmy, that's right. Yeah. And then came down to Nelson. Came down to Nelson. But schooled yeah. in Wellington. Just went to Upart College for four or five years in, in Wellington and played first 15 there. Yeah. Had some really close friends that I still keep in contact with there. Um, good experience playing rugby at first 15, but we were sort of, I think, second of then. And, yeah. Um, and then came back down to Nelson and played senior bees yeah crazy yeah hey? <laughs> and you were building at this stage eh? like you were a builder for like six years before yeah footy took over started building at 18 and then built till i was 25 yeah Not far out and that was a cool part of the club is like yeah most people were studying like yourself or yeah. getting a trade and then tuesday thursday training run around play touch and then do a bit of training and get ready for your club game in the weekend and give it everything for the boys and yeah. work really hard and then have a good weekend, a few beers and real sociable at that time in the club scenes and I think that's something that I miss a lot. We, we were real successful here. Yeah. And we built a really good culture um, and then as the like Tasman got made and you had something to aspire to be, yeah, get a professional, but it took a lot of work, you know. Um <laughs> And then, don't know. Yeah, I, I remember one preseason in particular where you, I don't know, you were on the frame, frame, but you weren't quite getting the con- the Tasman contract or anything. So you you thought about a position switch. You were going to become a second five. This is what you you planned. I remember going down to botanics and you're practicing your wipers, <laughs> your wipers into the corner. 
shanking them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not sure if second five is going to be a spot, but um, you're pretty keen on it. So talk me through that move and why you thought that. I think it was Bevan that said maybe oh, was it? Yeah, change to midfield and there was Poffy and Zane Winslade and stuff at Tasman at the time and I wasn't getting, I wasn't, I was getting making like the 34-man squad and then get cut when yeah. they cut the team down to 30 and I just wasn't good enough. I wasn't consistent enough and I wasn't really big, like my frame was small and I wasn't naturally um, that big and that didn't help with my physicality and that but yeah I know back looking back now I wasn't good enough I wasn't consistent enough and then when I took it more seriously and made more sacrifice in my training and Mm. tried to understand the game a bit better then I eventually made it but it was a long process yeah yeah it was eh because it was a mission man and it was intense I remember training with you a lot of those sessions and we used to go pretty hard like remember um going into like the actual sides and thinking these sessions aren't as hard as some of those ones that we used to do. Like we did used to train hard and uh, it was cool to see that you go through those uh, ranks and get to where you got to eventually. But um, another move was when you went down to the to Buller, played sevens or was it sevens or fifteens as well? It was sevens and I played fifteens too. Yeah. So that was a big change in my mindset. Yeah. So I think I'd worked really hard for three or four years and got cut a couple of years from that 30-man squad for Tasman. And then I was like, far out. I'm not going to make it. I just got to suck it up. Had so. you given up on the rugby dream in your mind? In my mind, Pretty yeah, much, yeah. yeah. And You're on the piss heaps at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I was a lad. Yeah. I loved it. It was cool, <laughs> man. That's what I liked about the culture, you know. You could work really hard yeah. and then have fun, party with your mates and recover Sunday and do it again. Yeah. And the year before I went down to Buller, I was like, man, I see all these semi-pro people with the the Marcos and the super teams that were training all day. Mm. And I was slogging working, man, you know, like, eight, nine hour days every day and it's hard. You wake up at six, yeah. go to the gym till seven, then go do a nine hour shift and then training after. Yeah. You do that for three or four years, that's tough. And that's like like Tane Robinson, he's mm. done it with Craig Moore, mm. working with Seymour Builders. Like that's been tough. Yeah. But it builds your character because you know what hard work is. And then I did that for three years, trying to make it, didn't make it. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to quit work and give it a really good crack. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So I I had a mortgage at the time and I had a house and I was a young dude, I was like 24. Um, I thought I'm going to take a six month like sabbatical off building yeah. and give it a really good crack. Yeah. So I put everything in, trained, tried to understand the game, got my body right, fit fast and then I got dropped again. Sure. I was like, yeah. fuck. Done. Oh, I had enough. Yeah. And then I realised I went down to Buller at the time of my life, I was working with Craig down there with his old man and Roscoe mm. contractors and doing some building and we are working 12-hour days building. <laughs> <laughs> and the people down in Reston work hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing 12-hour shifts four days a week, sometimes five days a week, and then we'd go up to Westport, play in the weekend for Buller, yeah. and then go back down work another week and I did that for eight months and then I played for Buller down in Queenstown in the twen- Queenstown Sevens comp and that because I'd, cause I'd like let the dream of rugby go yeah took the pressure off took the pressure off bro let it go to get more and then I realised that and what I really understand now is rugby is more about the culture and the excitement of what the game brings yeah it's not about trying to be a professional and then being an all black it's about it like the, you can never play as well as you can when you're playing free and confident and just loving the game. Yeah, you're, you're never going to be as good if you're not. Yeah, if you don't have that mindset. And then after playing sevens for Buller, it helped me with confidence mm. to run and tackle and be just confident with the ball. And I came up, played club the next year, and I was a completely different player because mm. I'd let it go. And then I was able to be play free, more carefree, and with more confidence and. Yep, and then I finally made it. 
Do you think that six month period where you did train hard helped as well, or um, was it a combination of both of them, or do you think it was mainly just the fact that you let it go? Oh, it definitely would have helped with my body. Like I'd built a bit more muscle, and yeah, yeah, probably understood the game a bit more, and um, but mainly mental. Mm. Yeah, more more so mental. You know, like six months of training, you can lose that in a couple of months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally. It was mental, Jim. Like, I completely yeah. changed my mindset about what I thought. And I've, yeah, even at super level, like, for me playing super rugby, I, I needed to be really on to be good. Mm. And I need to sacrifice and do the right things in my preparation. If I didn't do that, I wasn't good enough to play consistently at a good level. Mm. But I think I still then, I needed to take the pressure off mentally and then not worried about, not worry too much about performance and, enjoy the game more and the experience that I was having instead of being like but I'm trying to play really good and yeah yeah you see it all the time in young players yeah. eh? we put too much pressure on ourselves and I think that's maybe a lot to do with the culture yeah. and rugby in New Zealand yeah right that's fascinating so then you do make Tasman you don't play a huge amount that first year behind a couple of like poffies and stuff of the world and then was it the following year you start getting a bit more of a crack and you make New Zealand sevens, and you spoke about that earlier, but that being a, a bit of a game changer for you to give you that confidence that you were, I guess, good enough. Yeah, it was. I never really got a real good crack at New Zealand sevens either. And again, again, that was another stepping stone where I tried to develop confidence at that level, but never really did. Mm. And then, so I played a couple seasons of Mitre 10, and I was getting skittled. Like, <laughs> you think of Mitre 10 now, it's. <laughs> um, <laughs> you wouldn't think like it's it's a good level, but when I was playing, it, I still wasn't good enough to play that level well. Yeah, and then I thought, shit, I've got to go to another level. <laughs> mm. So then one off season, I think it was twenty. I played sevens, twenty eleven. Didn't really get much time for NZ and wasn't super confident at that level. But then in twenty twelve, I came back got cut from sevens I think and thought man I want to give try and make super and I knew that I needed to get my body bigger because I was like 91 kgs oh true yeah I was really light at the start of my career and then I put on 12 kgs with a local guy Brad Josie helped me at results 12 kgs that's a in an off season yeah we used to just do three hour sessions (laughs) (laughs) And I remember just spending all my money on falafel. <laughs> you know, falafel gourmet. Yeah. <laughs> That's I, why I the owner knows you so well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was having two a day and thinking like I was eating cream rice thinking it was good for me by the can. <laughs> can when nutritionists cool. told us cream rice was like the dream <laughs> snack. <laughs> it's just sugar. <laughs> yeah, and then the six months during that um, pre-season for club, I put on heaps of weight. So straight after the 2011 Mitre 10 Cup season, I was like, man, I'm going hard. Yeah. And I went hard for six months and I put on 12 kgs and then I was way too heavy in club and I was basically <laughs> walking everywhere, but I knew I was physical. I just couldn't sustain it. Yeah. And then that following year, leading into the 2013 I had a pretty good season. On yeah, the balance. Yeah, oh, my body was bigger and I was actually always determined and I worked really hard. So mm. that sort of filtered through maybe with my mindset in the 2012, 2013 season when we, we did pretty well in the second div and then moved up and lost to use in, yeah. in the final. Well, the that was, I remember that game against Hawke's Bay. That would be one that probably stands out for you here at Tea Park and um, close game. Go Like Tasman had always been... You know the battlers of the comp, really, and then to see them win that competition and in a game like that with the crowd, like right into Ehi West on that last kick, like some special memories for you. That was a buzz, man. Yeah, at the time I didn't realise. Like, yeah, we knew it was massive, and I, I shared a video on my Facebook the other day. Um, it was KK talking. It was like Sky Sport came down oh, and yeah, him. Yeah, he yeah. was a legend, man. You look back at the passion of the community on. Watching the Marcos then, there yeah. were thousands of people out at Tea Park. Yeah. Um, and that was probably a big reason why EHI missed that kick. But mm. we were battlers, like we were finishing second to last, third to last, right through to yeah. 2011. 
and then Rangy and KK sort of took the team and we had a vision and we were playing a real expansive attacking brand and our philosophy was like move the ball mm. get exciting get excited about our attacking brand and inspire the, the town you know yeah score tries yeah. back yourself and we managed to we managed to do that and then grow our defense and our discipline and set piece and yeah we had a couple of good years but we had a lot of support from the community you mm-hmm. know it was like because we were coming up together as the the club scene with the people that from the marcos were playing club mm-hmm. and then we got successful in tasman yeah and then those players we ended up getting heaps of super players and are now all blacks and mm-hmm. it's like there's something that's missing there for um, the connection between our province and the club to mm-hmm. keep that excitement and the community going it's mm-hmm. it's definitely sort of yeah it's I think it can yeah. be brought back mm. and was it the f- post that season you get signed to the Crusaders I don't remember you being a Crusader but yeah for um, eight minutes <laughs> <laughs> is that all you got yeah yeah so were you a full squad member yeah, 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 true. I think there was a season where Richie had a year off and oh, he was yeah. taking a sabbatical, and I jumped in. And Matt Todd was like the number one. Yeah, it was after the 2013 season when we did win that Hawks Bay Championship final. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wasn't fit enough. Oh, I wasn't. I wasn't fit enough. I went down there preseason. I realized, wow, I'm not fit enough. Is this because you were too worried about putting size on? I just wasn't. You know, you go from. Tasman to your first super campaign and it's with the Crusaders. Yeah. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> they were fit and they were elite and the, the training intensity was like it probably even more so now. But for me, I was just like hanging around at club level and <laughs> yeah, um, just didn't have the, the base for endurance and didn't understood, didn't understand what it took like to back it up day to day. I didn't have that either. Like yeah. the day to day training, I didn't have that in my body and I really struggled. But Matt Todd played awesome. He was a really good player. And mm. I got an opportunity against the force, like round seven or eight. And then eight minutes in, man, popped my rib and I was done. Oh, and true. I was out for six oh did you start that game? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. niggly. Eh? It was a buggy, yeah. It was, it was a shame because I'd worked really hard to try and get an opportunity. Then I got injured straight away. Mm. And then that was it. <sighs> Didn't mm. get another crack, but then. And that's tough, like, because. Because you were an older athlete, how old were you at the time? Like 26, 27, 26. Yeah, and to get that crack and then have it taken away, how hard was that sort of injury at that bad time to deal with? It was just frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a big step. Like when you have these, I think, the development stages in your career and and the time, it's it's way different than what you see now. But was it hard? It was frustrating. Yeah. Because if I'd, if I'd, been prepared and gotten fitter before I went down there I could have handled it more yeah and kept up better Mm. I remember the first one of the first days of fitness testing like we did a bronco and I I did pretty good and I think I beat Matt Todd by one (laughs) (laughs) I thought yeah sweet I'm all good and then 15 minutes later we did this running thing (laughs) I was like bro I just put everything I had into that into the I think it was the beat test bro yeah and then I came in something like dead last in this 3k run or something I was like man this is tough I couldn't sustain the conditioning yeah Yeah. well I could imagine you doing that just going so hard in that one event like just like (laughs) they didn't tell me I'm competing here because you're you're a competitor eh like um, wanting obviously there can probably be competing against Matt Todd, doing anything you can to beat him. He's probably knowing that he's got another four hour session coming up. <laughs> and he's been in it for yeah. like, the environment. That's why I think uh, the development stages into professional rugby really helps. Yeah. But if you don't go through that like I did, it's like you, you learn a lot fast and it can probably be a little bit like yeah. costly if you don't understand what you need to put in. Yeah. So what stopped you being a crusader the following year? Was it just. Richie was back. Oh, yeah. So they got rid of you and Jamie yep. Joe calls you. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. How did he sign you? I know he's quite good at signing players. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? No, he was all good. I played in the 2012 Maldives team. Oh, yeah, under so, him. Under him. Yeah. And I'd played pretty well, and uh, I was already signed for the Satyrs the following year, and then we played the 
Highlanders in 2013 in Christchurch and he came up to me in the changing chairs. He's the man, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the Crusaders just smash the Highlanders <laughs> and he rolls and sits down. Oi, what are you up to next year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh, nothing. I'm not signed here. I'll be keen to come down. He's like, yeah, come down. And then, so I think I signed there for a couple of years and um, I went away with the Maldives team again on 2013 and this is a funny story about Jake. I did my knee like the last play of a game. I think we were playing USA or something. Oh, did yeah. my knee, did a bit of damage and I was going to be out for three or four months. And he rings me up and he goes, how's the trip? <laughs> this was after the Maldives tournament. It was before pre-season of the Landers 2014. Yeah. I was like, no, it was good. It was good. I enjoyed it and you know, good experience traveling. And I've got this bad knee and I'm probably going to be out for three three months and he loses it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Don't your doctors know? You know, yeah. This isn't my fault, and that's where the communication between even the Maldives doctors and the Highlanders doctors there was none. True, it's crazy. So I'm out for I've got I've got a contract to play that's out for three months with mm. a buggered knee, and the coach doesn't even know. So these things in our rugby games only just starting to develop, like the confidentiality causes yeah. with players, medical stuff. That's good, but not with rugby players when they've got damaged knees or concussion. Yeah. It needs to, and I think it's better now. It's like clear transparency across the board so everyone knows where a player's at. Back then, mm. like Jake was nutting out saying, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at you. He's nutting at me like it's my <laughs> fault. I'm like, bro. <laughs> Hang on, playing for my country. What 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 was it like um, playing for the Maldives? Because it was cool, and you were obviously playing for them before you'd played Super. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. did you feel like comfortable in that environment, or did you feel intimidated? No, it was really good. The 2012 season was just like there was mainly like I think there was a few Super players, but mainly provincial players. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. true. Um, that's where I met a lot of the boys from the Landers. Jared Hoyata really looked after me. He was oh, a good yeah. fellow to me. I yeah. was like a new sort of dude. and um, You know, I didn't feel the pressure there. It was different. It was like the multi teams that, that's a really nice thing about the multi team is more of a, it's real family orientated and it's just the, you try and build the culture before the professionalism of the game. Mm. And that's really important, I think, for all teams to understand. It doesn't have to be about Māori, but the teams are actually about family and culture. Yeah. Instead of before you go and try and win a World Cup mm. or Provincial or Super. And you just do it. You just do it at the Crusaders really well. You can see it. It's mm. obvious as, but a lot of teams don't do that. It's about um, player in, playing good. Yeah. <laughs> He's in. Yeah. He's no good. He's out. Yeah. And that's where players, we we sense that, eh? Yeah. Players sense that and they won't give it everything. If, if, if everyone's not all in and you don't have that culture or the family sort of environment, you don't get the best out of everyone. And the Māori teams, the first couple of years I was in it, Jake really brought that. Mm. That's, how, that's how I think, one of his biggest assets is he's, yeah. he's really empathetic for the players, whether you're playing well or you're not mm -hmm. he cares about the person more so about the rugby player and and um he's honest yeah and players can handle the honesty i yeah. think that's what we forget the players are honest to each other and that's how you get the best out of each other but as the higher you get up i think the honesty goes out the door a little bit mm. i think i'll tell you a story about the landers this is a good one when i went down there and when i was coaching six weeks into the campaign of 2021 Highlanders season I find out Brownie's leaving True. overseas halfway through the campaign yeah I remember that I lost it Jim I was so gutted yeah um, and I think that's where if if Roger and whoever organised that had been really clear with me and the other coaches the management the players didn't know at the start then there wouldn't have been a problem. Mm -hmm. But it was a problem for me because I've never been in a team and I've never wanted to be a part of a culture that isn't together. We're on the same direction, going the same way everyone's in. Yeah. And that's how you can build something special. Yeah. Halfway through the season and then your head coach just leaves, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was gutted and I was bitter. 
<laughs> Everyone makes sacrifices to do things, and yeah. And you just not, you need to be clear and transparent from the start. And if you've got things like that that are going on in professional teams, they need to be open and honest with players, coaches, everyone. Mm. Otherwise, you're going to end up having a disjointed team. Mm. And I love the Highlanders, but that's what it's been like for the last couple of years. So I'm so stoked to see Jamie go back there and hopefully revive them, and I'm sure he will. Yeah. yeah well, he obviously did during your time there because obviously I remember that 2015 final pretty well um, on paper I don't know if you guys felt the same but that Hurricanes side was way better than <laughs> <laughs> was way better than your side but um, that's culture man 100% culture and what you're talking about that whole thing that everyone's playing for that same purpose and you could see it you could feel it out there yeah, Can't, guys were smoking me. Like it felt like every time I'd carry, it, I'd get absolutely smoked, like so hard. I was like, far out. These guys are these guys are on. Yeah, it was unreal. I was an only. I had a hamstring season that year, and I only played the semi in the final. But the boys that really, really carried the team for the good group court, the core group of players that were in the team consistently through that season man they had they had an awesome season mm-hmm. and it was cool to see and watch during the year and then be a small part of it at the end was unreal and they had their ups and downs like I remember I think it was the Waratahs they got a hiding 55 10 or something mm-hmm. three or four games before the semis so it wasn't all just Hurri- I remember the Hurricanes pumped yeah did you um it must have been like a couple of games before as well up in um Hawke's Bay or Napier and it was like, I think you guys rested a couple but I remember that game because I was like, oh, Stoke, we're sort of playing these guys again in the final because we are just beating you by about 50 points and um, mm. going into that final thinking, oh, sweet. But no. no. <laughs> we had it like, we had good coaches, yeah. Jamie, Brownie, um, Scott, Storm. Um, they were super innovative for that time, mm. like the way we were playing. Brownie used to always talk about kicking stats and ball and play time. Yeah. Um, Stormy was awesome with defensive, like tactical kicking and pressure plays. And um, Jamie was awesome around the set piece and being innovative at defence and attack with the mauling and mm. different specials and. And then our attitude was right, and it was sort of just come together in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I guess, like any team, you have to go through those hard weeks and learn to get better and come out the other side. And we had good players too, man. Yeah. They just hadn't been ex- like they weren't showing. Yeah, <laughs> hadn't had their opportunity, or yeah. all coming with a little chip on their shoulder. I mean, like Waisaki Naholo's of the <laughs> world, eh? Like had a terrible time up at the Blues, got those opportunity down there, and. Malakai um, was the man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, our backs were elite. Bucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the buck truck. He was the man. But our forward pack was really underdogs. Mm. Like, they were basically Mighty 10 Cup players. Yeah. And then to go physically against some of the better teams, it was cool. Um, and that was all attitude. That's where Jake really got the best out of a lot of the players in that mm. team. Yeah. And obviously, the probably the... Number one question, I reckon it was like 90% of the questions that came in for you were post that 2015 final, like the celebrations. Obviously, there was pictures of you in your kit for, I don't know how long you're in your kit for, but a decent amount of time. <laughs> and Talk to me about those celebrations. Uh, four days I was in my kit. Was four, it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what came over. Like, this is so good. I'm not taking off my jersey. There's no way. <laughs> I can't believe it. You think about it, I think about back now, I was like a club player for seven years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grinded it out doing a trade and playing club. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, I'm in a super final. <laughs> I'm not yeah. taking my jersey off. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> and that was so cool to experience that. What a buzz. And I was just a small part of it. Mm. Um, and to be around the players that you're with and to do what we did against a team like you guys had, you were awesome players and had been for a long time some of the legends of our game in our country Um, and the do was like all night in Wellington (laughs) still running around with my boots the next morning yeah 
think I got told by the manager to put some shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> and were you supposed were you supposed to fly out with the Maldives that night? Oh yeah, yeah. This is another thing about culture week, and hopefully you got some time. I want to yeah, talk about yeah. it. <laughs> go, man. So like, that was a real interesting experience for me because I had been so um, because I think my character and I really want to I want I want to experience winning a Super Rugby final and spend time with your family and the friends that you did it with. Mm. Well, I think the next day the Maldi team was supposed to go overseas. Yeah. And when I'd sort of heard that we can't even have a couple of days to experience that with the team and there was six or seven of us and we were like, man, this is nuts. You know, you just put yourself through this eight month pretty intense campaign, have an amazing experience and enjoy it. And then the professionalism of rugby says, go away 24 hours later to the next campaign. It's like, that's so far away from a positive culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And I tried to speak to a few of the boys and I was saying, maybe we can organise with the Maldives coaches just to go two or three days later. It was like, nah, Mm -hmm. there was no reason for us to go. They had like a game eight, ten days later and, you know, just roll in a couple of days late. Mm. That's where I think commercialism's taken over our game and it, it's it's been detrimental to the game and mm. to the players because you can see it in the performances and, and the campaign and the campaigns at super level, the All Blacks and even our spectatorship. You know, if, if, a, if a community... And, and the rugby culture isn't thriving, both spectators and players, because of the pressure maybe being too much. Mm. It's because of things like that, like the expectation to move on so fast from something you've just given your life to. Yeah. That's, that's, it's irresponsible. I honestly think it is because you get the best out of, like that story I said, when you drop the pressure and enjoy what, yeah. re- what the game is, then you can get the best out of it. So So you're in that celebration, I think it was in Kurt Baker's episode, he was supposed to fly it as well and he remembers you sort of holding a meeting with those guys (laughs) and saying, come on guys, let's let's stay. You obviously stayed, you didn't go on that flight. I had a niggly hamstring and I was going to be, like my hamstring was buggered and I was, I could have gone and then tried to grind it out but it was, I could have been at risk of buggering it even further. Yeah. So my doctor said that it might not be a good idea if you go straight into a campaign you've just drunk for three days or, yeah. you know, two days and then you're going to go to a Maldives game. You might mm. cause more damage. Um, so, yeah, I spoke to the boys and I said, hey, like, there's six of us. Let's just say, like, let's connect with the manager and the Maldives team and we'll try and see if we can go back a couple of days late. And mm. they said no. And then... I was like, well, my hamstring's not 100 anyway. I can probably say that I'm going to stay with the boys and that's the way it is. But an interesting thing with that, I had a phone call from someone at New Zealand Rugby and they said, hey, what's up? You're not coming to the Maldives tournament? I said, yeah, my hamstring's not that good. And I said, hey, we should be going a couple of days later. And they said, well, this is the campaign schedule. As a player, contracted player for New Zealand Rugby, you have to meet these schedule requirements and we could send you to some sort of disciplinary board mm. about not going. And that was my introduction to the professionalism of our country's game. And I've and I've always seen it, and now I see it more because you look at the community game and the provincial game, it's not going well. And it's because we've been overrun by these high expectations to go week to week, month to month, and it's like I said, it's detrimental to the player and the the communities around with supporters and stuff. So mm. I didn't end up going away on that Maldives trip, and I had you know the best five days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never ever forget that. <laughs> and to sit back and experience it, so like I think we had a five hour lock in <laughs> in the morning to Tevin. It was out of control. <laughs> I remember crying for about an hour. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Because of what? Just happiness. Just so happy, man. It couldn't believe like, you're couldn't getting believe calls it. from NZIU. <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't. That was, that was just like a thing that I'll never forget. And it's made me a bit more aware of what happens in, in a professional sport. And yeah. I understand, man, we've got to be professional and get the best out of the players. But I think it's gone too far. 
Mm. And that was a good example for for me to see it firsthand that what disciplinary board what yeah that's not a thing <laughs> <laughs> that's not a thing Jim and of course you want to do the best by each team you're in yeah but they just absolutely they like degraded what you've just been through mm. and first ever the Highlanders are still celebrating that win but yeah. Eight yeah. years on, you know, <laughs> you're gonna see them gonna go two days later. Yeah, and the boys that didn't experience that do, you know, they were more so part of that team than I was, mm. and they had to go to a campaign. And no one remembers those molded tournaments, you know, mm. at that time for those players. Of course, it's an amazing privilege to be a part of a Maldives team, but what's three days for a player? Yeah. What's three or four days? You know, it's not right with that with that situation. And mm. I just I hate to see it happening in our rugby culture yeah no, good well on you, you got to have something you got to stand on something yeah right? you got to have good solid um morals mm. and for me that's the most important thing to me i'm not always right man i'm wrong about exit. do you reckon it cost you playing for the all blacks i, I always, no, no i just wasn't you know, good enough you reckon yeah no because I, I i reckon that following year i don't know if it was the following year but you were next level like you were pushing it I think I I think the 2014 year I went to a camp for the All Blacks. I think Toddy was out and Richie, oh, yeah. might, Richie might have been injured. And like, I look back at that time and I was still all effort. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even know the game, Jim. Yeah. I really only learned the game when I started coaching. Oh, really? Yeah, at at detail and with detail, and it would have been awesome to be an All Black. I always dreamed of being an All Black. How mm. cool! But um, I think you could. If you were lucky enough to get an opportunity through injury, that's may that may have happened for me, but I just wasn't, and then I wasn't consistent enough. Like I, at Super, I I worked hard, but I wasn't always playing consistent. And mm. I, like I said, I need to be at my best every week to play well. And if I wasn't at my best, I just didn't always play the best. So it's like. Mm. So then, how did it all end for you? Like we've spoken about your concussions, and what was the final blow? And um, when did you know that was it? My last game was 2016 for the Maldives. Oh, yeah. And I'd had multiple head knocks and every clean out, every tackle, I was getting ringers like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Little, little knocks. And I was thinking, man, this isn't good. And then I, I think in that game, I, you know, you know, you do like a couple of tackles against the pad before the game. Yeah. I can't remember who was, in the, who was holding the pad, but I hit his elbow and it was just like both pressure in my head and I'd had these issues. Mm hmm. And I played 30, 40 minutes into the game and I was like, man, I'm not right. And I just walked myself off. Good, yeah. And then I, was, I remember sitting in the, in the changing room and the doctor came up to me and I was, even then I was like, man, my neck's not right. And he tried to do the HIA test and I was like, don't worry about it. It's my neck. Mm. And then I couldn't really see that I'd had concussion problems for months. And then that was it. And I tried really hard to come back, like three or four months. I went hard did all the return to play protocols just gradually didn't overdo it but when I got to 80 90 percent I was getting sharp pains in my head like mm. the running intensity was what was getting me I could do weights reasonably well mm. but when I was doing high running intensity stuff it was it was no good and then um and then six months after trying to return to play I finished and you know even with the way that I finished with concussion I remember reading a an article in the media up in here and I was with the Tasman team in 2017 and it was like the mysterious case of Shane yeah. Christian I, yeah. and I was like that's really frustrating man yeah a few questions came in about it like what had what was this mysterious illness and stuff and yeah. I was like well, yeah it's crazy it's, that it was portrayed like that yeah it's really crazy and I think there was a few people that were, had been finishing around that time and to me, at that stage, I really thought that they didn't want it to be in the mainstream. So weird. Well, it's it's disheartening for a player that's just, you know, given everything to a sport and yeah. then had concussion problems and consecutive head knocks. And then the media comes out saying that, what, saying some sort of mysterious case. It's like, hey, let's just be honest about what's happening. Like, people get head knocks, and if it's not really carefully looked after, yeah. you have to finish. Yeah. Even the a disappointing thing was I'd done these return to play protocols carefully and gradually, and I kept on f failing after three months. And then it, 
in my mind, I'd known that I'd had multiple head knocks and I wanted to retire. And I didn't see a specialist for concussion for nine months from the start of my issues at the Landers. Nine months. Nine months later is when I seen a specialist and I had to ring New Zealand Players Association, Rob Nickel, I had to ring him and say, hey man, I need to get an appointment with the specialist because, you know, GPs and mm. they're not specialists. Mm, nah. um, That's crazy. So the idea to d- d- delay the inevitable for me was incredibly frustrating. It was hard and I thought, man, what's going on? This is what's happening. I've been open and honest with my doctors about everything. Mm. This is what it looks like. This is the, like, I had records of having concussion problems in Tasman, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that we're just not quite, we don't, we don't have it quite right around Mm -hmm. our medical system and the honesty, transparency around concussion in New Zealand rugby. And I think if we get things right with the transparency, categorising and making sure that we have each and every concussion filed for each player through the grades and Mm. then um, make more awareness around concussion. So in Spain, Fozzie was telling me that they make all the age grade players wear headgear Mm. and we know headgear doesn't do nothing. (laughs) 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 <laughs> it cracks me up hey? People are like We're here, here to help your concussion Or like you, Someone who's struggling with concussion Then wears headgear the next week <laughs> <laughs> That still happens eh? <laughs> It does still happen Yeah yeah I was going to say I play that Yeah but I mean you know It might help with confidence And it helps with scratches or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not going to stop it You know Head no. against a forearm or a knee Yeah and when you did finish, when you made that final call that yeah, you're not going to play again, how hard was that? What did you miss? Miss the game? Did you know what you were going to do because it was taken away from you so quickly? Back nah, to building. No, nah, I was buggered, man. Yeah, yeah, I was buggered. I, didn't, I was, I was worried about getting day to day. Really? <laughs> yeah, I was bad. I was super bad. And like I said, that six month period where I couldn't get clarity around my, like. I needed to speak to someone and get some confidence around what does concussion look like? Mm. How long am I going to be buggered for? Where am I with my symptoms? How come I can't run past 80%? Those sorts of questions weren't really answered. And that's stressful. Mm. So for you know a year, I was pretty stressed out and re- really uncertain. I come up to Tasman in 2017 and I hung around with the team like... I was pretty crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I still thought I was a player. (laughs) I could probably tell you some stories about that. Go on, eh? I remember we had some new new coaches, Leo Crowley. He would have a laugh about this, I think. Yeah. (laughs) He's a good man. He's a good man. He's done really well with Wellington last year. And he was doing the D. And I was frustrated as because we weren't that good and we were struggling away. We actually ended up making the semi, I think, that year. Or no, we made the final, but we got spanked by Canterbury. And we had a young team. Oh, yeah. You know, really young. And we did really well, but I was nutting out and I'd go up to the office and say, this is what I think's happening and you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Yeah. And we're having big arguments. And the other thing around me then is like when you're – got issues with frustration and your concussion problems you can be quite you know abrupt yeah yeah (laughs) and uh i was definitely that (laughs) (laughs) is this how you got into coaching because like you said you weren't really you weren't really thinking of the game technically tactically as a player so is it when this transition happened you're up in the office telling everyone what to do (laughs) everyone's just like mate (laughs) may as well sign you because you're saying all the right stuff Nah, I think Ray looked after me, you know. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He'd had concussion and he cool. looked after yeah. me and he was really good. And um, But I, I remember texting Ray. <laughs> like I'd pretended I knew what I was talking about in that year when I was still a player. And yeah. I said to Ray at the end of the season, man, can I get a job coaching? I want to do the D next year. And then it was just text. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I'll talk to the other coaches and the board and see what happens. And then I was like, no, no, I need to know now. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what, you want me to tell you over text right now? And I was like, basically, <laughs> I just thought I was crazy. <laughs> but you got it. But I was crazy. <laughs> 
yeah, I did get it. But that's what I'm like, I guess, and it's it's probably been um, it's a good and a bad thing. Mm. But I was lucky at that time that Rang really looked after me because even that following year in 2018, I was still pretty buggered, you know. And I'd, I'd I'd try and I'd try and understand the game at a different level so I could help coach with the boys mm. and then deal with my concussion symptoms like anxiety getting up in front of a squad of 30 when you don't even know what you're talking about, bro. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. And I used to do some funny things like bring in axes and try and try give the boys like, you know, big packs of chops and stuff yeah. and best tackler and come up with different things. And it was fun. But I, I really respect for how Rangy helped me and showed me a lot about D and the game and coaching and understood that I probably wasn't that good with my head and mm. they just like gradually helped me and Goody was there at that time and he was a big hand with helping me with different things so I was, I was lucky to get in coaching through Tasman yeah I, th- I don't think a lot of places may have said they wouldn't have give me the chance even Tony Lewis when he was here he put up with me for a few years like I went from playing to coaching after a concussion I was still thinking I was a player for a couple of years mm. yeah what do you think you would have done if they didn't pick you up I just would have went somewhere else I decided coach. that I wanted to coach oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was like I was mind. talking to once Ash you get Dixon. something in your mind mate you're, you're gonna yeah. do it I was talking to Ash and I was good mates with Ash at that time and I was still good mates with them but um I was like, bro, who's your D coach next year for the Bay? <laughs> <laughs> like, I might as well come up there, you know? Yeah. I just wanted to coach. I like the environment. I love the culture, and I thought I could help. And if I could learn and get an opportunity somewhere, then I might be able to do it. So, mm. What didn't you love about coaching? Um, not getting my own way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm stubborn, I think that I'd want to do things the way I want to do it. And I think that I'm right until I get proven wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny way to be, Jim. Yeah. Because you need someone that you're challenging to be really clear yeah. and calm so they can tell you quickly and you're like, oh, yeah, no, I'm wrong. It's all good, bro. I'll yeah, carry yeah. on. But if yeah. they're not clear and calm and then they get angry, it's <laughs> like, fuck, we're going to have an argument, damn it. <laughs> oh, like, far out. I always remember you being really calm and clear as a coach. Like, when people would challenge you, you'd always be real calm honest and never really looked like you got too rattled it's not definitely quite often it wasn't how I was feeling was it yeah, yeah and true. I used to have to think about it a lot like I'd try and like I got bad anxiety bro yeah I didn't yeah. even notice that either like you always looked so confident and um, you've always been one of those guys who can say whatever it always felt like you'd just say whatever um, you'd go into a shop and tell them what's the cheapest price they could give you. <laughs> like, not many people <laughs> go and do that. Like, uh, you just always looked like you had no sort of fear or anything with that. But to hear that you had anxiety in those meetings and stuff was, was interesting. It was crazy. Um, I never had anxiety until I had my concussion. Oh, yeah. And then when that happened and then... It would come and go depending on how our head was. Mm-hmm. Like if I hadn't been sleeping well or um, if I'd been on the computer too much, that really got me, you know? Yeah. And then I'd start getting anxious. And then what I did know is that it was just temporary. And then if I could just get myself through it, it would pass. Mm. But I had to sacrifice myself for the boys basically, you know, like – if I wasn't honest with myself and just like, it's all good, man, this is just invisible, it's your mind mm-hmm. and people here care for me. And I had to, actually, I trusted a lot of the, the coaches and the players. They really looked after me, like the, the senior boys that I played with, Druzer and Davey and mm-hmm. like all those boys, I knew that they had my back and mm-hmm. I knew I wasn't perfect. But they knew I meant well and I cared and I wanted them to be good and I wanted us to be successful and... I think that's what gave me the confidence to get through that mm. without without stressing out about it too much. Mm. So you just got to, for me anyway, I just put myself out there and I know I'm not perfect. No one is, but mm. anxiety is an interesting thing because like, I know it comes and goes. I know it's just temporary. Mm. And ice baths, ice bathing is really good for it. Is that the best thing for it? Yeah. Well, hundred percent. Yeah. Is that instant, or is that something that has a longer effect? 
you got to do it after multiple days, but it does something to like suppress your nervous system. So mm-hmm. if your nervous system's really wound up like I was at the Landers, then you're you're operating on a different energy, man. Mm-hmm. It's like it's real it's real like a gnarly wired up sort of energy and you can function on it fine for months and you don't have to sleep that much and you're you're basically fine but it, when you calm down yeah and you get back to normal life it's like whoa i'm beat up mm-hmm. yeah we normally just sleep eat healthy rest and recover and you're normally happy and stuff yeah when you're operating on a weird nervous system it's just like you're wired all the time mm. Mm. i do so love I, a good ice bath but what were you doing 15 minutes <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so i july last year I, I was like straight away i knew i said i had, I had to do ice bathing mm. and i was just doing two or three minute cold showers morning and night and when that was easy i got an ice chest freezer mm. and then i started out just a couple minutes three or four times a day and then, because I wanted to be healthy, and yeah. I need to get my energy way up, so then I don't come back down quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just started ten minutes, three times a day. Yeah. Fifteen minutes, three times a day. Yep. So more and more, and then, uh, like I'll get back and I'll get my. I'll tell you a story about um, a two week period, and it wasn't that long ago where I'd, I'd been real stressed and my concussion was having issues and I was having real foggy and headaches often and um, I started getting real paranoid. Mm-hmm. And I think this is something that Billy may have experienced as well, man, because in these moments of paranoia, it's not really you. And I, I, I didn't see it at the time, but I was having these paranoid moments thinking I'd misplaced someone, something and someone had stolen something from me and someone had come into my house and robbed me and I just because I wasn't thinking clear enough I couldn't see the reality mm. and then when you go through these sort of manic stages and when you come out of them you got pressure in your head because you just put your body through this pressure well if that, that happened to me three or four times over a two week period and then it just wipes me out for three or four days and then I'm bang back to square one with my head and I've got to be in bed and I've got to do all the right things to oh, right. recover in there and that's because like stress um, too much workload uh, having issues with your cognitive problems and then keep on pushing yourself mm. then you, you do you definitely start losing your ability to think clearly mm. and then the putting paranoia on top of that it can be really really hard and it's not easy to come out of these things. And I think experiencing that recently. Was that the first time you'd experienced it, paranoia? Nah. 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 You had that. I had it earlier in my, um, like, couple of years after the concussion, but during the worst stages. So 20, 2018, I started my first year with coaching for Tassie. Mm. And then I'd do the Tassie season. It's been the next sort of six months recovering. Mm. And I was helping with the, so I was contracted for Tasman for the three months in the season, and then I'd do a little bit of community stuff in the off season. Mm. But that off season, I was buggered. Yeah, you know, I was like tired, bro, yeah. and it would take months to come right for the Tasman season. All right. So that was three years, and during that time, I had paranoid moments where I'd, I'd misplace something or I'd misinterpret a friend and mm. have a crack at them and then push them away because I think man you're playing up but it's really because I couldn't really see things that clearly mm. and then I'll tell you a story about when I was bad after the 2019 season we won and it was unreal season I think it was our first um, premiership victory mm. who was that against a Wellington out here oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I went out, had a couple of beers with the boys. The next day, I was wiped out. And you wouldn't usually drink, eh? No, I wasn't drinking, yeah. but like staying up all night, yeah, that's oh, tough yeah. for me. Would wreck you, yeah. And then like a couple of beers, like literally a few beers, and that's it. Mm. And then the next day, I was buggered, bro. I like, felt like I was on a boat spewed during the day. Oh, and I was like, man, I've got to, right, the season's gone. Uh, we're up really high and functioning on that like super anxious type of energy that it's hard to understand but my nervous system would be buggered mm. and then when you come down and then you're by yourself trying to recover and then that's when I started having issues with paranoia and stuff mm. and then 
going through the recovery stage with my head, but it's not really that clear. Mm. And then I was doing all the right things, cold therapy. This was only a couple of weeks after the 2019 season. Every day, and I was seeing a psychologist about just hanging on, mm. Mm. <laughs> keeping it together. And then for a couple of months, every day I was walking in Isle Park and... My head was so bad, man, that I'd walk past trees and I'd see myself hanging from it. What, an image, like a visual image? A visual of... image, and then I knew that my head wasn't right. Far out. Yeah. And that happened for, you know, a good month. And I'd spoken to a psychologist about it, and I'd, that's how bad my concussion was. And that's, I was, I was coaching full time. Mm. <laughs> but the, the, the fatigue that the season had on me and I'm and the, the fatigue that the season had on me that's like when you when you lose the energy and you lose your battery and then you're operating down here yeah it takes a long time to get back yeah but as you're trying to come back you're trying to get your head right yeah and on the way up your head's not functioning yeah. that clearly you know yeah. and then you're thinking things and you're doing things and saying things that aren't yourself and I understood that then that I wasn't in a good place. Mm. And I'd looked into things like hallucinogenic drugs overseas, MDMA, mm. you know, the stuff that was on the news the other day on the Ranfilly Shield. Yeah. Well, they used that for, um, like, therapy in the States mm. for different mental conditions, and they can use it for concussion di- con- conditions to rewire, like, your neurological pathways. Mm. There's MDMA therapy, psilocybin therapy, ayahuasca, ibogaine, these things that actually help your your mind to maybe see a different perspective or change the wires in your mind. Mm. Have you done those? I did. When I went after that really, really bad stage, after the 2019 campaign, I knew I was bad, bro, and I was yeah. like, man, I've got to go um, and try and get into something like this because the care that I was getting from like ACC in New Zealand we don't have that in New Zealand Mm -hmm. it's just antidepressants and if you're having problems sleeping take some sleeping pills Mm. you're not going to get out of a really really dark hole if you've had concussion and you and that's what you're going to get given Mm. and like my family understood what I was going through but I didn't have a partner Mm. so I was by myself you know, you're really, really isolated when you've got a concussion. I was like, if I'm going to get out of this, I'm going to go and try this stuff because it's... And I'd done heaps of research and I'd spoken to a specialist here outside of New Zealand Rugby and ACC that said you can probably do the psilocybin therapy, which is like mushrooms. Oh, yeah. But it's it's not just take a few rush mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> it's like medical grade stuff, even the MDMA. Yeah. It's medical grade stuff, and then they give you therapy while you're under the higher oh, yeah. influence of it. And we had that that trip to the states. We played a couple development teams over there for the oh, for the young right. boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was I was going to help Gray with that team, and I'd had this problem leading up to that, and I was like, Gray, shit, I can't be involved in this team, but I want to come, and I can help when we get over there, but I've got to get my health right. Mm-hmm. So basically, I was like see you at the airport bro <laughs> and they trained for you know six weeks beforehand and I was struggling man every day was a grind and I went and helped out it was really cool to be a part of that young group and like some Braden Stewart and Tane yeah. was in that team so yeah. all the young boys that are out there now um, and then after the comp I started going around the states trying to get this therapy and um I'd rung specialists, and I was talking to a specialist through NFL over there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'd spent thousands of dollars, bro. It was expensive, mm-hmm. and they, they had a lot more treatment that was possible, like this laser treatment stuff that you can put in your nose, your ears. And mm-hmm. um, There's a guy, Tim Ewer, over in Mapur. I think he does things like that in the, the hyperbolic chambers, oh, the yeah. oxygen that you can yeah. take. But ACC doesn't cover that sort of treatment. Um, and... So I couldn't get in to do the EMDM, EMDA and the psilocybin therapy because they had, you have to do like three or four sessions and then stay for a couple of weeks and then do them 
oh, yeah. sort of over a three month period and it was expensive in the States. Mm. After the trip with the boys, I was living in hotels, like just going from hotel to hotel. Um, but it wasn't like a holiday. Mm. <laughs> I was still really, really worn out and fatigued. And it was like I'd wake up in the morning, go for a wander around, get back home to my hotel and sleep in the afternoon, go back out, have a feed and go back home early. That was my trip, yeah. And I was trying to get a break away from NZ, get away from the the New Zealand rugby scene and then get my health right. And I was looking for this therapy. Well, I ended up going down to Mexico and then taking ayahuasca three times. Um, And that was probably one of the hardest things I've done. Really? Mm. Ayahuasca is like this root plant that's a really really strong hallucinogenic true um trip yeah and i did that three times and the experience was wild man what happens the first time so you've got a shaman and you can do it as a group yeah and but i wanted to do it by myself because it's like a a private thing i really need to get this thing under control because i'd lost sort of like my mind wasn't playing yeah. the game anymore. It was yeah. a little bit out of control, and I known that rewiring your mind can it can be possible with these drugs. And the first time the shaman was around me and like playing music, and they're like they lead you in and out of this trip. And the drug showed me this this uh, like it's like a story that maybe all of us think about what is why are we here, what's our purpose, what's the meaning of life, and it just. I'd, I'd crack up laughing and then I'd try and think and then something would come to me like a thought mm. and it'd be trying to tell me it and then I'd just miss it and I was like what is that what just happened I'm trying to understand what happened and then I'd crack up laughing again and I'd try to pick exactly what's coming into my mind Yeah, and this went on for about an hour and a half the same sort of routine and after the next day, I realized the first trip, the experience that the drug was trying to show me was just that life was more like experience. And then you take what you learn from that experience and implement it into the next like activity oh, yeah. or the yeah, next yeah, yeah. goal in your life. And then you learn again and you go back to start experience, take your learnings, implement it into the next goal learn again and then go back to the start Mm -hmm. and that that seems real simple but for me it just gave me like a more of a understanding of there's no real pressure on me this is i guess i can just go through this slowly i'm gonna learn it's gonna be stop start i'm gonna Mm -hmm. it took a lot of the pressure off of trying to come right the second time i took it um i went in there with an intention of trying to get something out of it yeah and it wasn't good. It just it kicked my ass and I ended up spewing and you get really bad diarrhea. And what was your intention? It was stuff that I wanted to get sorted with my family. Oh, okay. Before I went over there, I'd had this big barney with my brother-in-law. Oh, yeah. And my sister and we were having like just normal family stuff and um, that was like I was really hurting from that and I still haven't spoken to him and maybe after this I will. Yeah, but, he's listening. Yeah, no, maybe. Um but I, with ayahuasca, you don't want to go in there and think you're the boss. Yeah. <laughs> it just dominated me. All right, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah. It, um, it made me really, really crook, and I was violently spewing, and this went on for six or seven hours, and then oh. it takes days to recover from this thing too. So, And I didn't really get deep into the trip. Um, so the, I did the first two sessions over a week period. The mm. first one was really good because I felt like it taught me something about life, just yeah. the process. And then the second one, I tried to go in there and get something from it, but it didn't work. Mm. And then the third one, I was like, right, I'll do it again in six weeks. I just ate green vegetables, no coffee, no alcohol, no weed or anything. And I was just chilling in Mexico. And... The last time I got it, the guy said, hey, man, you can take like a couple of different portions. This is really, really strong. Or you could just have this one. It's sort of similar to what you were having. Mm. And I took the 
the strong portion. It was maybe three or four times as much as I'd had the first two times. Jeez, even though you had that reaction after the second time. Yeah, yeah, because I knew this was bad, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> you walking around Isle Park thinking that, yeah. you know, seeing these visions, uh, it was serious for me, man, because mm. I was at a stage where if I'm going to come out of this and not do anything crazy to myself mm. and try and fix myself, this is the way I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I, I, I'd done a lot of fasting and dieting for six weeks up to the time I did it. And we went into lockdown in Mexico. Oh, that's right. You are stuck <laughs> over there, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I was stuck over there. And then I was in like this 40-person 40, 40 um, Airbnb hostel place and everyone left. And the Argentinian dude that was the manager, yeah. I got on with him well. He was like, bro, look after the cats. This is you. I'm off home. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in this little beach town that no one was there. You know, it was a really chill place. And I was like, I'm going hard. I'm going to get my shit together and take this drug and hope, hope like hell it can get my brain rewired. Yeah. And during that six-week period where I was – have I ever spoken to you? No, nah, <laughs> nah, this is all new now. <laughs> During that six-week period where I was dieting hard out um, and I was trying to exercise, like I was doing a bit of surfing and walking and heaps of yoga. I was doing a hell lot, like a lot of yoga. Man. Yeah. And then, um, but I was also watching, there's this documentary on um, Netflix. It's like World War Two <laughs> <laughs> in colour. <laughs> and bro, I watched every single episode. <laughs> Over this six week period, and man, I was like, "Whoa!" Yeah, <laughs> that was really interesting to see what happened back then <laughs> in the forties, bro. That's why I, that's why I post what I'm talking about on on social media at the moment. Yeah. So I watched that, and I was preparing to do this ayahuasca, and he gave me this really intense potion, and I was like, "Man, I'm taking the whole thing, and I'm locking myself in my room in the dorm, and no one was there." Oh, you're by yourself. By myself in this hostel, yeah. by myself. So the, the thing with the, the ayahuasca is maybe 40 minutes or an hour after you first ingest it, you can, you spew, like you purge. Mm. So it comes into your digestive system and then you spew it back out and then you go into the trip. Well, I took it by myself and I'd had three or four times more than I'd had previously. And then I ended up falling asleep. Like I put on this YouTube video of, of like the, the um, shaman music which is awesome it sort of leads you guide you through the trip and it was an hour and a half later and I'd sort of just woken up from a sleep and I heard this massive crack like it was thunder mm. and a real loud lightning bolt and I was like whoa that's out of it what was that and it was my stomach oh. and it was an hour and a half later I looked at the time and I was like whoa this is going to be gnarly normally you purge after about 30-40 minutes and it was an hour and a half Yeah, and I'd fallen to sleep and then the the crack of the noise was like, shit, it's about to kick in. And I sat up on the edge of the bed like this, and I was a different person. What do you mean a different person? <laughs> I was in Auschwitz prison, prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> so my, I was, my body was like just bone. What, like skeleton? Yeah, like I had stool. I just had no muscle on me. Oh, just skin like on a, bone. Imagine a prisoner. Yeah, okay. In the Nazi camps, that's you know that tragic, tragic time, man. Well, that's because I'd been watching all these, yeah, this documentary, and then my mind had taken me to this space where I'd become a prisoner, and I broke down crying, and I was on the edge of the bed, and I was like, "Shit, this isn't good." And I knew I was still Shane, I was still me, but my body and my eyes were like showing me something different. Mm-hmm. And then I went into the bathroom, which was just in front of me, and I looked at the mirror, and I was like, whoa. Like, the, the hallucinogenic strong, bro. And I was a, I was the same person, but my body had lost all the flesh in it, and uh, I was just bone. Like, you imagine some of the videos yeah. you would have seen of that time, and that's what I'd been watching, and that's what I became. And I just fell on the ground and started crying, bawling my eyes out. And then spewed up, and then for the next hour and a half, tried to deal with it mentally. <laughs> Far out. Yeah, and I thought um, it was like people talk about having past life regressions and experiencing something that you may have already been and come to a new life as this, mm. but it was just because I'd 
put so much time into learning about what had happened and but what that taught me was the appreciation of what I've got <laughs> yeah yeah if you see and feel then it wasn't just the the physical trip it's the emotional trip that you get with yeah ayahuasca it changes your whole consciousness <laughs> all right like yeah, it was intense and it was like an appreciation afterwards that I knew that even though I'd had concussion and this is how the drug seems to work like mm. even though I'd had concussion and I was really struggling and maybe being a bit suicidal and lost those times where I seen visions and lost a little bit of a track in my head if I could get through that we are fortunate to be here yeah <laughs> you know like and I still feel lucky and then it just after that even though it took me a long time it took me a couple months to recover from the trip because it's actually hard on your mind I really really changed after that yeah yeah completely I came back from overseas it took me a couple months to get my energy back and then I had this new appreciation of what my life was and even though I still get concussion problems mm. I, I've just got a way deeper understanding of how fortunate I am even though I went through that yeah that's cool it, it is incredibly cool man and <laughs> Because that's all it is. Mm. It's your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what that drug taught me is that, yeah, I've had a couple head knocks. But it's not the end of it. Yeah. You know, you can grind through stuff and yeah. you can get better and you can look for different treatment. And no matter what happens, I'm still luckier than a lot of people that are bloody unfortunate at the moment. Mm. Um, so you can't get that sort of treatment from anything in New Zealand, you know? Mm. And I don't know like the, the core details about how it changes your brain, but they don't have treatments like that for nothing. Mm -hmm. These these sort of drugs have been in civilizations for thousands of years, and even doing MDMA in a therapy mm -hmm. session, that's something that we could try and investigate for mm -hmm. people that have ongoing concussion problems. And the psilocybin stuff, it's not just a mushroom under a plant where people trip out and look at the stars. Yeah. This stuff can actually be super helpful because it just needs to change the way you're thinking and give you a bit more strength and perspective like it did for me. Mm. What you went through, like, you obviously put a huge amount into getting right. Like, you invested a heap into your mind to get it right. And I guess that's where a lot of guys don't do it you know they sort of don't give up but they just don't invest what you have done into your mind and is that where it all goes wrong like you've obviously done really well to get your head into the space it is now and um, still have your probably issues but um, you've had it made a huge commitment to get your mind back on track mm. what 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 drives me I suppose mm -hmm. <sighs> Well, doing that drug, man. Yeah. Like, you think about three years, I was really beat up. And then after that season, I was probably the most happiest ever been. That's still the ring. Mate, you're, on, you're on fire that year. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a special time. And then even after that, I just went bang down and then struggling. And then I knew that was the worst I've ever been. Mm. Like, to have those visions and consistently it was going on every time I'd take this dude for a walk. Yeah. And I just knew that if, if I hadn't, if I didn't do something drastic and I didn't do it for me, I was going to end up really bad. Mm. And that's something that I was pretty fortunate to come across. And I did get the right help. And I spoke to a specialist and she said, this is probably going to be really hard for you. You're probably better to do the psilocybin one or MDMA, mm. but this can work for people with concussion. Mm. You don't get told that from a lot of places with maybe around the New Zealand rugby format with ACC and stuff. Yeah. It was like a holistic specialist that I went and seen. And that gave me the confidence that what I was reading online and seeing these experience of people that have done it can change. Like people that have bad drug addictions mm. go overseas and do the Ibogaine and it snaps them out of a really bad heroin addiction. Mm. Like the worst, bro. Mm. So it can change your mind, these types of drugs. And for me, it helped a lot. And it's not that I'm back and it didn't fix me mm. but it gave me a better perspective and then and then after that I went into the 2020 campaign with the um, Marcos again and we managed to win again up at the Blues yeah and I'd 
I'd thought I'd been talking to the landers and then thinking, man, I, if I'm around the boys, mm. I'm going to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't, I knew I was going to be, a, I would have struggled, you know, it was going to be tough doing the landers season. I know they supported me heaps. Yeah. The coaches, Brownie supported me and they were like, looked after me heaps as well as they could. And Dermo was really good. But, being in the environment like that and trying to get that professional career going on, it was hard on me, mm. but it was be, it's better to be in that environment in a supportive group than by myself when you can, you know, put yourself in a hole. Yeah. So that's really why I got into that full-time role with the Landers. Mm. But I think what gave me the confidence and the motivation to do it was the oh, ayahuasca trip, oh. 100%. I wish, I wish Billy could do that, man, yeah. but it cost me money. Mm. Like it was thousands of dollars. So I mean, it's a big investment it's a into your own. Investment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that aspect, like the financial thing, ACC doesn't pay for those types of things. They'll just think you're a loony, bro. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I had to do that because otherwise, you know, how bad was it going to be? And mm. I, th- I think if Billy could have that support, and if I'd know what I know now, I would have just said, bro, go do this. I'll come with you and I'll pay for it. Yeah. Because there's nothing that he had wrong with him that we couldn't have fixed. Mm. And yeah, why why I did it because it was that bad, Jim. Yeah, Oswald Park wasn't a good experience for me. Willing to do anything. Yeah, and I was. It was just it was simple as that. It was. Yeah. I was bad, Mate, but it got me here. It's here, yeah. right? And willing to share enough. How why do it? I think? Yeah, so I'm comfortable. I was never going to share this, and you know, I told Goody two months ago mm. <laughs> that that's how bad I was after that 2019 season it was only because of bill passing that I've seen like man I've got to say some shit sure. yeah because I mean I've been trying to get you on this thing for probably three years since I started like I, I've always loved your rugby journey just and just the rugby journey itself but what what's happened post it and with all the concussion and all that adds to it and it gives you so much um, opportunity to help others and um I didn't think I'd ever be able to get you on, but something's changed, like you said, in the last few months, and um, it's awesome to get you on and be able to share this so openly and honestly. It's, it's well, awesome. it's it's just from the experience of Bill, like yeah, shouldn't have happened. And when when Billy passed, I was like, oh no, this is crazy. I was really shocked the first couple of days, and mm-hmm. went and seen him up at the hospital, and I was like, man, this is tragic, and I was gutted. But then the next month is when I realised how it shouldn't have happened mm. and it made me realise how we're not set up for these situations. Yeah, We don't have what it takes to help someone in that position and we're scared of helping them because of what it takes and mm. you have to be honest about what what some of the shit people are dealing with at the moment. Yeah, And I think... Um, that's what really hurt me and really, really devastated me was because if you have a situation like that with Bill, with his stuff that he was dealing with in life and his ex-partners and his family stuff and his financial situation wasn't good and Mm -hmm. he was here with the girls and working like hell man, he's inspired so many of the girls and the FPC team, like mm-hmm. used to hang out with them, give them confidence. They've said so many stories since I was with them this year, yeah. and how much he he looked after them and believed in them. Mm. This guy that was beat up really had issues, and he was giving still. Mm. And then who was there to help him? Mm. Like, and no one's seen it. Mm. So that made me realise, man, if we can't see that in someone, if you have problems, you we're not safe. Everyone's in a very dangerous position in mental health, and you see this like around New Zealand. Mental health's never been as bad as it's ever been yeah. at this current time, and um, you see Mike King, yeah, sacrificing his life for people in our country, you know, mm-hmm. and giving so much to try and help the youth, especially, and he's up against it because you see someone like him with that much humility sacrificing his time, his effort, his families life and then you see our politicians acting like children Mm -hmm. using the media to spread false information they call it misinformation but really they're just hiding the the missing information that's quite often 
more often than not the truth mm. about things that are happening in our country and mental health's one of them. 100% and that's why I think you sharing your story is going to help so many people, especially anyone who's had concussion or anyone who's got mental health issues. I think the more mm. people can hear stories like this, the better it's only going to help. But to hear your story, to hear what you've gone through, um, super inspiring and super cool to hear how honest you are about it all. And um, I know it's taken a tough situation and losing Billy to give you the... Um, it's confidence to share your story and knowing that it's going to help people. But I'm so stoked to get you on the podcast and um, have you share it. Cheers, Jim. Uh, it's been awesome to be here. And I would say just for Billy's family, like, I suppose just incredibly sorry for the loss. Mm. So many of us really loved Bill, um, what he gave to the union, how he was amongst his peers, not just at Tasman. Mm. the three or four super teams he was at and it's a massive loss and we're all feeling it so especially his mum and his sisters they're mm. amazing people and I'll see them again so yeah yeah, no, well said because yeah, like you said true legend lucky to see him at the Hurricanes environment at the time and mate all the guys loved him <laughs> mate. just so honest very similar to you like we just say what he thought and um, didn't really worry about what people thought or Appeared that way anyway. He so. wasn't scared, eh? He wasn't no. scared of being himself. No. And that's what I loved about him. He was himself and he... Yeah. Um, yeah, was happy to be himself. Didn't care what people thought, so... Um, uh, so sad to uh, experience what he went through. And, um, mate, you were awesome at um, looking after his family post that. And um, you did awesome work there. Cheers, John. You're a lad. <laughs> You're a lad, man. <laughs>